Welcome back to Pattern Recognition and today we want to look a bit more into how to actually apply those norms in regression problems. So here you see the norm dependent linear regression and you've seen that we essentially now put up the norms that we've seen previously into the optimization problem and here we have some matrix A and some unknown vector X and we subtract it from B and take the norm of this problem and we can write this down as a minimization problem. So the variable that we're looking for is determined as the argument of the respective norm problem here. Now different norms will of course lead to different results and the estimation error epsilon that is a scalar value can be defined as the difference between the optimal regression result and the x star which denotes the correct value. So this then gives rise to a residual, so R1, R2, up to Rm, where M is the number of observations, and they can then be essentially computed as the element-wise deviations from our regression problem. So this is essentially nothing else as a x minus b and the resulting vector gives us the residual terms. So if b is in the range of a, the residual will be essentially a zero vector. So it can be completely projected. Now, the minimization using the two norm is something that we've already seen. So there we simply have a x minus b and the two norm of that. And this can then essentially then be rewritten as the minimization over the residuals. You know that the residuals can be expressed as above norm. So we can write this up also as a x minus b transpose times a x minus b. And now we can do the math. So I omitted this in the previous video, but now you see the full solution, how to actually express that. So you see that we multiply all the terms with each other. This then gives x transpose a transpose a x minus x transpose a transpose b minus b transposed a x plus b transpose b. Now you see that we can rearrange this a little bit. So there is two terms that are essentially the same if we rearrange them. So this can be written up as x transpose a transpose a x minus 2b transpose a x plus b transpose b. Now if you want to have the minimization, we take the partial derivative of this term with respect to x and you see now that we can essentially write this up as 2 times a transposed a x minus 2 times a transposed b equals to 0 and this then gives the well-known solution of the pseudo inverse for x hat. So this is a transpose a inverse a transpose b. And this is of course valid if the columns of A are mutually independent. Well, what happens if we do other norms? Well, if we do that, then we see we can, for example, use the maximum norm. And here then the result of the norm would be the maximum over the absolute value of the respective residuals. And then this can also be rewritten into the following optimization problem. So we minimize the residuals subject to that the difference of the respective residuals is lying between minus r times a vector of ones and the upper bound is r times a vector of ones. So we're trying to essentially shrink those boundaries as close as possible around our remaining residuals. Then we can also look into the minimization of the L1 norm. So the L1 norm is the sum over the absolute values over the residuals. And here this you can rewrite into the minimization problem that we have this vector of one transpose R 
and then this can be used as an upper and then lower bound in the constraint optimization. And again, here our R is a vector in an m-dimensional space and we have this vector of ones only. So let's look a bit into the application of this. So let's look into the ridge regression and unit balls. So we have here the minimization of AX minus B and the two norm times lambda and the two norm of X. And let's visualize this a little bit. Let's take the unit ball. The unit ball of X would be exactly this circle here. And now we can look into our actual problem domain so we can gradually increase the circle and then you see if you want the norm exactly to be one you actually get the hit here and this will be then the solution for your respective optimization problem. Now what happens if we take a different norm? So let's take the one norm for our x so again, our original data term is, is in the two norm, but X is regularized with the one norm. Then the unit ball looks like this. So we have this diamond shape. And again, we are increasing our data term. And then we see we hit at this position. So we essentially find the solution that lies on the coordinate axis. And this is also the reason why people like to use the L1 norm, because it prefers solutions that are lying on the coordinate axis. So this is why L1 norm is typically associated to a sparsifying transform. And by the way, if you essentially have the L.5 norm, the effect will be even stronger because you have this peaked shape. And if you have an L0 norm, of course, you will find only sparse solutions. But of course, this then also results in non-convex optimization problems, which are kind of tricky. Now let's look a bit into something that is called compressed sensing. If you work with magnetic resonance imaging or other reconstruction problems, also in CT, for example, then the compressed sensing theory is very important. We're only hinting at this here. If you want to know more about compressed sensing, there is, for example, classes on magnetic resonance imaging where these concepts are explained in more detail. So here we assume that we have fewer measurements than required to estimate the parameter vector x. So the solution will be underdetermined and therefore we need regularization and we can call a vector s sparse if it support meaning the number of non-zero entries is less or equal to S. And then the compressed sensing tries to find a solution where you essentially minimize the norm of X. So you try to find a sparse solution for the solution X given to the data term that, for example, A times X equals B matches your measured observations. And if you're able to find these sparse representation transforms, they are typically then also incorporated into the L1 minimization. Then you can actually reconstruct the original signal from fewer measurements than actually required to represent, for example, the entire image. And this gives rise to a lot of dose savings in X-ray and much more rapid measurements in MRI imaging. So a very, very important technique that has been used to practice in imaging in many, many different ways. So really, I recommend to have a look into those specialized lectures. For example, our medical image processing lectures will talk much more about the details of this type of math. Let's look a bit into the so-called penalty functions. So this is motivated by the discussion of the different norms. And we can use that to express certain ways of constraining our regularization. And there you then introduce some function phi that is applied to the residual. And then you sum up over all of the residuals after applying the phi. And then again, you have this constraint that the solutions should follow the data observation, so our AX minus B. 
So if we do that, then we can find penalty functions very easily. So the penalty function plays the role that it assigns a cost to the residuals. And if phi is a convex function, then the penalty function approximation problem is also a convex optimization problem. Let's look into some of those. So you can already see that we can now reuse our norms. So for the L1 norm, it's simply the absolute value. And for the L2 norm, it's simply the square. And then this gives rise to the following penalty functions. And here you can see, for example, that the 2 norm punishes outliers much more rapidly because it's increasing much more rapidly and therefore outliers also have a pretty strong influence on any kind of L2 optimization. While in the case of the L1 norm, the outliers, so things that are far away from zero, are not punished as strongly and therefore typically also L1 regularizations are known to be more robust. So let's look into more penalty functions and a very well known one is the so-called log barrier function. And this is chosen to be essentially constrained around a certain area within the region A. And as soon as you leave this area, then your penalty will be infinite. So this is then often used to prevent solutions that would essentially go into areas beyond A and they would have an infinite penalty. So therefore these solutions are not feasible for your minimization problem. You can vary this a little bit. So if I increase the area of A, then you see that we also have a solution that is not as strongly regularized. There's also dead zone linear penalty functions. So here you essentially start introducing zones that do not receive any penalty. So everything in a closed region in the vicinity to zero doesn't cause any penalty. And only if you move away from there, you introduce a penalty. And of course, you can vary this function as well. You can have the large error penalty function. So here, you essentially define an error that is assigned to large errors. So there the error or the penalty is going to be a square. And as long as you are below a, then you simply set it to the square of R, so of the residual. And of course, you can vary this one as well. And here you simply say, OK, if I do an error, it just counts as error. But I don't care how strong the error is. What else? There is the so-called Huber function. Now, the Huber function is a differentiable approximation of the L1 norm. So within the area close to zero, so if the absolute value of the residual is below A, then we essentially take R to the power of two. So in this part, we have a quadratic behavior. And as soon as we leave A, we just do a linear extrapolation with a linear slope that is continuous in the gradient. So essentially, we can also compute derivatives on this one very nicely. And we don't have to deal with the kinks that are, for example, introduced in the L1 norms. So we also have different variants of the Huber norm. And you see that it behaves linearly outside of the area close to zero. Then let's compare them a little bit. This is the L1 norm. This has a kink. So if you want to go towards optimization of this one, you have to deal with subgradients. And you also probably then want to use shrinkage kind of optimization programs. So if you're interested in subgradients and how to deal with functions that have a kink in optimization effectively, I can really recommend to go to our lecture deep learning. So there we have plenty of functions with kink. And it can also be solved. But if you prefer to remain in the domain of simple gradients, then you can work with simple L2 norms. We've also seen the log barrier norm that is shown here, where we essentially then have an infinite penalty as soon as we leave the target domain. Then we also have these dead zone penalty functions. Again, we have a kink here. So also optimization is a little bit more tricky, but again, subgradients save the day. 
And then there's the large error function. Again, we have the kink, and this is then also a non-convex function. So we kind of will have to deal with non-convex optimization problems here as well. This is the Huber loss. So the Huber loss is very popular or was very popular as an approximation of the L1 norm with a continuous derivative. So this has been used widely in literature. And today you don't find it as often because most of the time people are simply using the respective L1 norm and shrinkage methods to solve the problem. So what are the lessons that we learned here? So we have uh, considered vector and matrix norms in more detail. We have seen that there are important norms. The ones that we encounter quite frequently are the L1 norm, L2 norm, L infinity norm, and LP norm. And we looked into the respective unit balls. And we've seen that we can use them for linear regression as well, and that they range from closed form solutions to LP problems in order to solve them. And also the regular linear regression can range from closed form solutions through QP problem and combinatorial optimization problems, in particular if you go to the non-convex cases. So depending on the objective function that you are setting up here, you have to know the properties and then you also have to know which algorithm to apply in order to solve it effectively. And there you need to know the basics of constraint and unconstrained optimization, as well as convex optimization. So if you want to know more about convex optimization, I really recommend having a look at the lecture of Stephen Boyd at Stanford. It's really a very nice lecture that gives you all the different ideas how to deal with convex optimization problems. So next time in pattern recognition, we want to start looking into a new class of optimization problems, and in particular, things that are used in neural networks. And we will start with the basic perceptron and then go ahead and derive them up to neural networks. So I also have some further readings for you. I can tell you that the book by Golub is very good, Matrix Computations, then again, the numerical linear algebra, and as I already mentioned, the book by Boyd and Vandenberge, Convex Optimization. There's also a very, very good video lecture online available. So I really would recommend having a look at that. And of course, we do have some further readings. There is a very nice toolbox on compressed sensing, which is a very hot topic. And I do have comprehensive questions for you that will help you with the preparation of the exam. So thank you very much for listening and looking forward to meeting you in the next video. Bye bye.